ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for attending <coughs> this Brookings Doha Center, uh, a panel on Iran. My name is Ali Fatullah I'm a visiting fellow with the Brookings Doha Center. We're very pleased to have uh, a very timely discussion on Iran's internal and external challenges. <coughs> Um, I'd like to thank my dear colleagues at the Brookings Doha Center who organized this wonderful event. Um, I'm going to shortly explain to you the format. So we're going to have 90 minutes. Um, the first hour will be devoted to a discussion among the panelists. And the last half an hour, you're all invited to participate in the discussion and to ask uh, questions, but also, if you want, with very short comments. Um, <coughs> we're going to start by uh, initial statements by the uh, respective panelists. Before doing so, let me just briefly introduce them to you. To my left, uh, Mr. Mohammad Qasim Sajjadpour. He's a president of the Iranian Institute for Political and International Studies, IPIS which is uh, uh, the Iranian Foreign Ministry's think tank. From 2013 to 16, he was advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, on strategic issues. Between 2003 <laughs> and 4, he was ambassador and deputy permanent representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations. He received his PhD in political... <laughs> He also holds a PhD from the, from the university in the United States, as all our panelists, by the way, and, uh, and from Cornell. Last but not least, we are very happy um, to have uh, Professor Shafiq Gabra, who is a professor of political science at the <coughs> university. He is a former founding president of the American University uh, of Kuwait, where he also directed the Center for, uh, oh, sorry, he directed the Center for uh, Strategic Studies at Kuwait University, not at the AUK. He was also the former director of the Information Office of Kuwait uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, author of eight books, he holds a PhD in political science from the University of Texas at Austin. So I hope that despite the commonality of all our distinguished guests having a PhD from, the, from, from an American university, we're going to have uh, some controversies as well. Um, we're going to start um, with Professor Amir Ahmadi. Uh, I'd like to ask him uh, about the internal challenges that Iran faces especially after the revolt at the turn of the year, which uh, saw the most politicized protests in the history of the Islamic Republic, and spanning over 90 mostly smaller cities, and uh, were uh, basically uh, the working class poor were uh, taking to the streets, as Asef Bayot, uh, uh, the famous academic, uh, puts it. <laughs> That is basically socioeconomic poor people who have middle class qualifications and aspirations. And um, so they demanded not only socioeconomic justice, but also uh, some uh, also political demands. And it's interesting to see the slogans of, these, of this revolt that can be categorized in three areas. One, the demand for social justice. Secondly, uh, a critique of uh, basically all factions of the state, and thirdly, the combination between inside and outside factors, basically a criticism vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis Iran's regional policies and uh, the failure to uh, devote, for example, those funds for domestic uh, problems. So, Professor Amir Ahmadi, let me ask you about your kind of reading of the uh, revolt and its, uh, and, the, and its ramifications, but also, 
um, three years ago, you wrote a piece in the National Interest, uh, which was um, headlined, uh, Rouhani's new budget offers pain without hope. And so maybe you can also say a few things about uh, your criticism of uh, uh, President Rouhani's socioeconomic policies and uh, economic policies that might be also relevant yeah. to what, why the revolt happened. I have Thank to get so permission from, from the Saudi <laughs> ambassador for do, to doing that, but that's okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, I had planned to have a few pleasantries, but uh, I'm going to have to give up because I don't have much time. I want to just to thank the center for the invitation, Dr. Fatullah Najad for the kind introduction, and Mr. Kais Sharif for making a great uh, um, arrangement for the travel and the rest of it. Uh, I had uh, prepared uh, uh, about 15, 20, the 15 minutes uh, speech, but I'm, gonna, I'm just altering that and trying to uh, give the, uh, you know, the basic points of it, uh, answering your question. But to answer that question about the protests and my criticism of uh, President Rouhani, we really need to take uh, 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 back uh, you to, uh, uh, to the uh, revolution itself. Some 40 years ago, Iranians had a revolution called the Islamic Revolution. This revolution was supposed to provide for political freedom, for economic justice and development, for national independence, particularly in foreign policy, and to create a healthy, corruption-free Islamic society. Unfortunately, I have to say, none of the above has been achieved at least not to the extent that the Iranian people had expected and the price they had paid for these noble goals. Economically, Iran has not just only uh, uh, failed in social justice, that, the, that even absolute poverty has grown. 40% of Iranians live below poverty line as we speak. The gap between the rich and poor has never been this wide. You have billionaires with palaces on the northern Tehran and the small suburbs and others who don't have a shelter to live in. But also as President Rouhani just recently after this protest acknowledged very openly, he said, Hear what he said. He said, I am sorry that we have failed to improve your economic lot. That in the last five years, he said, your income per capita income has declined and that has reduced your purchasing power. Again, I am not saying that the president acknowledged. And he also said, Please let us know what the solution is. I said, God, for, God forbid, the man doesn't know how to manage, and he doesn't have a solution. He's so asking people for a solution. But anyway, so economically, Iranians haven't really achieved much. Let me just remind you that 40 years ago, Iran was either equal to or above econo in economic development side, similar to South Korea, to Turkey, India, uh, China, Taiwan, and many others. Those days, Qatar, the UAE, and others were way at the bottom of the hierarchy. Four years later, ladies and gentlemen, Iran is way behind all these nations, with some between 20 to 50 years behind. I think it's 50 years behind South Korea. Maybe 20 years behind you know, some other countries, but it is behind. Iran moved back in the last four years. Lost opportunity, tremendous lost opportunity. Politically also, this, the political freedom has ended up to become 
engineered periodic elections that take place between what we call the bad and the worst of the same political elite for four years, circling, recycling themselves, closing the society to anybody who is not with them. In terms of the national independence, I think the best example for me is the JCPOA, this, uh, the comprehensive uh, nuclear deal that made. It's the first instance in Iran's history that Iran gave up so much to a foreign power without being defeated in a war. Never Iran has given so much. Basically destroyed by its own hand an industry that its own people, kids, young engineers had built, putting concrete in that particular you know, reactor. It burns my, uh, my heart. And finally, in terms of the, uh, a good, healthy society, it doesn't exist. Iran is filled with corruption, bribery, nepotism. The political elite is using corruption in many ways, including paying themselves billion salaries or million salaries, getting loans that are largely illegitimate from the banks, and just direct stealing. So, and then in the meantime, our youth is unemployed, is drug addicted, and our, I have to say, unfortunately, even our women are entering into the kind of practices that I shame to say in this meeting. But the bottom line, Iran, as we talk about it, is not doing well these days. Now, there are all kinds of pressure, domestic and international, on the government. The government blames largely sanctions, foreign intervention for the problems. But they also say that perhaps 20% of the problems are due to this foreign stuff, from sanctions to everything else. 80% of these problems come from mismanagement, a government that is lawless, has no discipline, and it doesn't really recycle itself the way it should. That is, create a, a, a political elite that, that can lead the country. This is, the, this is what it is. Now, there are various groups in the country that are pushing for change. I believe the Islamic Republic has come to understand that the change is inevitable. My own, the title of my own presentation is State Alteration or Societal Disruption. And I believe unless and until the Islamic Republic alters its basic structures, a revolution, a radical revolution, even more radical than 1979, is almost 100% inevitable. I could promise you here. I first predicted the protest a year ago at a meeting, at a speech at Cambridge University. I said there that Iran sits, Iran sits on a, in a volcano that will erupt very soon. I repeated that promise of a revolution coming in many of my writings and in social media. And it came. But it came and it wasn't enough. That is to say, it was not big enough to make changes. But it is, I believe that protest was an introduction to that volcano that I am thinking will come. Now, as you said, the people who really participated in this protest were largely of two groups. One, young Iranians. They were from 18 to 25 years old. Some statistics say 85% in the streets were this group, who are unemployed and really have very little hope for the future. And the second group were the poor people and particularly in smaller towns, 
and outlying regions. Now, we saw that Tehran and some other large cities didn't really make a big move, and particularly Tehran, because Tehran has really colonized the nation in the last four years. Tehran's per capita income, on the average, in Tehran, is twice as much as the per capita average of, the, of the, anywhere else in the nation. Tehranis really have won after the election, but what Tehranis, not the poor Tehranis, a few on the very top, on the very top, and the middle class, particularly the higher, the upper section of the middle class has won significantly. So, and that's why they did not participate. But I have bad news for the government. Even this group is losing. Even this group is losing as we move forward. That is, they're going to move, they're going to lose economically more, particularly because I don't see that the President Rouhani's government will be able to deliver anything more than what it has, and that his so-called neoliberal economic policy is a disaster for a nation of the, that has gone through a revolution and a people that had expected economic justice, reform, and development. Ladies and gentlemen, no country ever in the world has developed in the first stages of its life through neoliberalism. Every state I know, from South Korea to China to anywhere else, the role of the state in the early stages have been the most significant, including here in Qatar or UAE and elsewhere. But what kind of a state? A state that is lawful, disciplined, and not corrupt. It's unfortunate to say that this is not the state we have in Iran. I wanted to stop here, okay, and take questions on my own plan for Iran of the future and others who are putting plans as well. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Amir Ahmadi, for laying the um, multiple dimensions of Iran's internal challenges. Before going on, I'd like to uh, ask you about a very short question. Um, you're very vocal when it comes to criticism vis-a-vis -vis the Rouhani administration. Mm -hmm. But what about the shortcomings of the previous administration under uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad? Yeah, well, uh, we say we don't, we don't wash the fault with fault. Okay, I have my own criticism of the uh, of Ahmadinejad's uh, government. Okay, uh, I, I call Ahmadinejad uh, representative of of the of, of the illiterate representative of the poor people. Okay, but Rouhani is a, a tricky representative of the wealthy. <laughs> okay, so a, they are very different. Rouhani represents the the wealthy, the the rich. Okay, we call the Ashrafs, the nobility, the people who really have it, and Ahmadinejad, the poorer sections. I believe both have mismanaged the country significantly, but in a completely different ways. For example, over the last five years, ladies and gentlemen, the per capita income not only has declined, but as I said, the poor people have become poorer under President Rouhani. That's not fair. Yeah, but I mean, many of the problems that President, the, the Rouhani administration had to face were uh, remainders of the Ahmadinejad's period as well, right? So whatever we see, for example. But again, again, it's just like the story. It's just like the story of Trump and Obama. Every, every, you know, uh, administration blames the previous one. Now, I'm not saying that Ahmadinejad's government is blameless, but believe me, believe me, believe me, give Iran tomorrow to me. That's why I wanted to become president. <laughs> I, I correct that country in two years. Okay. It's very easy. Iran is a very wealthy country. Iran has no problem. It has the second largest oil reserves, that, that, I'm sorry, the second largest gas reserve, the fourth largest oil, minerals, 80 million people, most of them are educated Perfect. and intelligent. Thank you. What Iran lacks, nothing but a good government. Professor a government Ahmad, that thank you. follows law and discipline. Thank you so much. So since we're not at uh, a, a campaign rally, um, so... <laughs>
let us move on to <laughs> now to the external challenges. Uh, and we are happy to have uh, Mr. Sajjad Pour with us, who is a uh, long-standing Iranian career diplomat with a lot of wisdom and wit, uh, if I may say so. Um, since the mid-2000s, Iran has established itself in the wake of the US-led occupation of Iraq as some, uh, something like a indispensable power in West Asia. And ever since, we have seen a lot of geopolitical victories of Iran, uh, also during the last few years. And uh, what, we, uh, what many see is that today, Iran is engaged in so many theaters of conflict across the region, so that it may be overstretched somehow. And the question is, how do you manage that uh, against the background of the internal challenges that also require a lot of, uh, I mean, financial and other attention? Um, so perhaps you could, uh, you know, talk a bit about, uh, you know, Iran's regional policies and ambitions, because there is a lot of various interpretations. But before uh, doing that, let us start by asking you who runs Iran's foreign policy? No more questions. No, thank you. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let me start by assalamu alaikum to my colleagues here and uh, expressing my sense of appreciation uh, to you and your colleagues in the Brooking Doha Center for inviting me. Uh, before uh, going to allow them, going to the uh, let's say answering the questions, uh, I would like to have a disclaimer that my participation tonight here is not official. If it was official, I had to respond to what Professor Ahmadi said from the beginning and reject him uh, from A to Z. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I don't have much hair, but I have two hats. I teach, and my main job is teaching. Of course, I also, uh, I'm in diplomatic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, interaction. Uh, so what I say tonight is of my own scholarly hat. And usually, uh, in conferences, since you heard so much of tough issues, I start by a joke for disclaim. And the joke, Professor Amir Ahmed, is a joke. He's saying, what's the difference between a camel a professor and a diplomat. Have you heard it? No. A camel can work and not drink for a month, and nothing will happen, you know, because they, this is the way that goes. And a diplomat, with all due respect to diplomats here, they can drink for a month and not work, and nothing will happen. Yeah. And professors and think tankers can work, drink, go to conferences, have comments, answering questions, and nothing will <coughs> happen. So in that spirit, let me have my own uh, professorial uh, answer to your question. I think, uh, first of all, let me challenge the, the title of this panel, if I'm allowed to. The title is challenging, Challenges of Iran. Why just challenges? Should we start by assumption that Iran is exclusively uh, about challenges, or it is also opportunities and capabilities and capacities. Is the picture as dark as we heard, or there are other elements in the picture if we are a scholarly and on analytical track? But uh, however, uh, going beyond the challenging of the title of Challenges of Iran, I think on the foreign policy that you asked, all of these questions that uh, you raised and the question that I had to work on, on the challenges of uh, foreign policy, I think there is a fundamental challenge for Iran, and that is the challenge of understanding Iran's foreign policy, how Iran's foreign policy should be understood. There are deductionist approaches, which reduce Iranian foreign policy to single issues. There are very simplistic notions of Iranian foreign policy, and there are other, let's say, uh, way of looking at Iranian foreign policy, which is very political, and everyone has its own narratives. 
I think in order to have a better understanding of Iranian foreign policy and the questions that you have uh, you raised, one needs to look at what Iranian foreign policy is and what Iranian foreign policy is not. This answers the setting of your question. In answering this fundamental question, I have ABC. A, alarmistic Iran is an erroneous, erroneous notion. It is 40 years that we all hear about Iranian threats and alarmistic notion that this country is dangerous, its behavior is dangerous, its nature of the political system is dangerous, it is, its capabilities is dangerous, its, let's say, uh, being in the region is dangerous. And I think these have proven to be, these notions are dangerous, not Iranian foreign policy. Why? Because they have inflamed Iranophobia, it has contributed to wars. Don't forget that Saddam Hussein <coughs> started its war against Iran with the help of some of the uh, uh, regional players on the notion that Iran is a threat. And I think this continues till today, and this is not what Iran foreign policy is. Iran as a nation state is for its security, like any other nation state, it's for well-being, and Iranian foreign policy is based on the national interest of uh, Iran as a nation state. My B is what I call builder Iran. Iran is a builder. Iran is a builder with respect specifically to your question in the region. Suppose that Iran was not in the region. We all know that Damascus was on the verge of collapse. And ISIS was, I think, 30, 40 kilometers to uh, Baghdad. So what Iran did, Iran provided security to the region. Furthermore, here I have to underline that Iran is the only country, regardless of to what Professor Ahmadi said, I think one of the most fundamental achievements of Iranian revolution, which is proudly it can be pronounced by anybody, is its independence. And independence is the most important for me as a person in foreign policy studies and foreign policy practice, I think is the most fundamental element of Iranian polity today. And through its dependence, Iran is the only country which is producing its security independently. No other country in this region is providing its security <coughs> domestically by itself. Furthermore, Iran is providing security for the region. And Iran is a builder in this regard. And regardless of what they say, Iran is building bilateral relationship, trilateral ones. I don't want to, to go to detail of what happened during last July here and the Iranian role. Don't forget that Qatar was a strangle, uh, and what Iran did opened is not uh, uh, just a space. I think Iran uh, was, by words and action, proved that it is building relationship based on mutual interest, and so on and so forth. My C is a cooperative Iran. Iran is cooperative in its foreign policy. JCPOA may be looked from different angles, but it's a sign of Iranian <coughs> global cooperation and crisis management. It prevents <coughs> a global crisis, a regional crisis. Cooperation regionally, let me here focus on recent uh, statements by, by our foreign uh, minister, at Munich conference last week, that we are for a regional dialogue. A regional dialogue is what he has emphasized. It's the base of cooperation dialogue. So uh, he even uh, introduced concepts of uh, network security as well as a strong region. A strong region means I cannot be a strong 
and my neighbor be weak. We need a, a type of interconnectivity and interdependence of interest among uh, neighborhood, and this is the base of security. I don't want to give a rosy picture of what Iranian foreign policy is, but it is 40 years, you know, I was young when actually I entered this business of a scholar, <coughs> uh, conferences, and I'm happy to hear, uh, to see actually, uh, first of all, I'm happy that I'm alive to see the 40th uh, anniversary of revolution, but always there had been prediction about the collapse of Iran, Iran being so, Iran is being weakened, Iran being so and so. And the Iranian revolution, which is uh, supported by Iranian people, including the, the three weeks ago on the anniversary of revolution, is a defiance to all this pseudo scholarly uh, prediction about the weaknesses of Iran, or what I started, misunderstanding on Iran. So may I ask all of us to revisit our understanding. It is hard when there, is, there are cliches, when there are narratives dominating in the field, in the press, as an Iran is depicted a dangerous one, Iran is though to really challenge. But look, what have we done? And compare what the others in the region have done to this country and what Iran has done. So I think uh, the most important challenge is the challenge of understanding and uh, misunderstanding and what I call cognitive mapping. And we need a redrawing of the cognitive map. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sajjad Poor. Um, you portrayed Iran's uh, regional policies as being primarily uh, of a defensive nature. Sure and acting somehow of a uh, benign hegemon. Um, Not hegemon, I didn't use the word. Or benign, I said benign. So benign, because benign, <coughs> actor, benign Iran actor. is providing security uh, for the region. Yeah. This is how you put it. Uh, but if you look, of course, I mean, there are different areas of Iranian operations. And um, with the West, we've seen constructive engagement uh, leading to the JCPOA. Uh, but in the region, uh, Iran's policies has not been viewed as constructive engagement. Um, is, do you understand part of the criticism that might be leveled against Iran's Syria policy, or do you think that uh, everything Iran did there is uh, primarily a fight against Daesh? Uh, good question. First of all... A very short answer, please. No, you, you, you phrase... You know, you, your phrase is replete of concepts and issues, and then you want me to be short. No, it was a question. First, no, first on hegemony. Iran is against hegemony, rejects hegemony, and furthermore believes that hegemony is impossible, <coughs> either by regional players or by global players. The era of hegemony is gone. Second, there are so many views in the region. Of course, you have Israeli Zionist view, you have radical, uh, but the, what is our job is to detect which view corresponds to reality. Now, the third point on Syria. Iran didn't start Syrian war. You read WikiLeaks, you read the documents. It was about uh, cutting the neck of Iran in the Levant. It means that, yes, it was an uprising, but it was hijacked by a strategic calculation, especially when you had regime change in Libya, by a te political technology I mean, being used by in external powers, then intervening, then rupture of the society. The same was happening in, in Syria, and the plan was to do the same in Iran, and the plan was to continue it in Russia. This is not, uh, let's say, an Iranian reading. I have heard it from Russian uh, uh, strategists. So what Iran did was 100% defensive in Syria. We didn't intervene. Actually, you see some actors in the region who are historically reactionary. Means very, very 
uh, reactionary in their thinking, but they became what I call revolutionary reactionary. They wanted to change regimes from outside by military forces. Militarization of the process, this is what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sajad Poor. Uh, Dr. Gabra, Professor Gabra, um, if one listens to the discourse on Iran in the Arab world, one is not sure if it's about legitimate concerns or if it's some kind of an uh, Iranophobia, as uh, Mr. Sajadpur uh, put it. How can we best distinguish between what is legitimate, legitimate concern and what is paranoia inside a geopolitical game of rivalry between, between, on one hand, the Islamic Republic of Iran and on the other, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? And what about uh, the Arab project? Is there an Arab project? What about the, do they have, uh, is there a future of the Arab project uh, that might be able to contain uh, what some might perceive as Iran's expansive policies? Thank you. Um, I mean, I will ask, the, I will answer the question on the Arab project maybe later, mm -hmm. because the first one deserves uh, some attention. Um, so on the one hand, Iran is a, an important player an important country in the region. One understands its role historically and in the present time. Uh, Iran is a country that may have and does have many concerns in its relation to the West, in its relation to the USA, in its relation to Zionism, and it does share with many Arabs an outlook regarding independence, regarding Zionism, regarding issues of threats that surround the region. So on the one hand, one sees that highly important country alongside Turkey in an Islamic context alongside other Arab countries, but with our focus on Iran, a country that feels a threat as a result of its nature of revolution, of independence, of seeking its own project. One sees all of that. But on the other hand, there is a, a, a series of issues that, that made Iran lump the entire Arab world in one basket. It, it, its project went in certain directions. It overplayed the sectarian side of the project. That doesn't mean others did not in the region. But since we are talking about Iran, it overplayed the sectarian <coughs> approach. And by doing so, it lost populations it could have gained in the region. There are entire populations that looked highly towards Iran's revolution in 1979. And lots of them, over time, feel different. So to, to look more concrete, let's take Iraq. Well, there was a change of regime in 2003. The US could not fill the vacuum. Iran did. OK, no problem. But what happened later is that Iran became very much involved in the Iraqi situation, to the point that even within the Shia blocs, those who are not close to Iran will suffer serious consequences, whether in elections or in overall representation. So in a way, there was an authoritarian, there was a, there was a domination project. Now, is this a function of fear from Iran's side, the eight-year war with Iraq, that Iraq should never be strong again and should never be united again? I see that, 
But that's the wrong policy. Because if it stays in that direction, it is destined to create forces within the Shiri bloc, let aside others, to try to salvage Iraq into a country that is friendly with its surroundings, but equally friendly with Iran. There is a difference between being friendly to Iran and being <coughs> a surrogate, being a follower, being a weak state that its politics is determined in Tehran. Now, I ask myself sometimes, I mean, and I, I, I there, there is also a, a, a marginalization of the Najaf at the expense of Najaf. There is a sense of Persianization in the south of Iraq. How true is this? How deep is it? But there is something going on in that direction, and it has an impact. So as Iran was struggling against the US and Zionism, and, 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 <coughs> and also as it is struggling against certain Arab states and regimes, Saudi Arabia, one of them, it overplayed the sectarian game, and it, it overextended its power. Now, when I look at Syria, on the other hand, but before going to Syria, even the ISIS issue, the ISIS story, if the Sunnis were not marginalized at that level, ISIS would not have emerged. Iran could have played a much wiser policy that would have not allowed such a marginalization to take place in Iraq by which ISIS. And now, if there is a vacuum, again and again, we are destined to further conflict. So if I go to Syria, the first six months, <coughs> the first six months of the Syrian revolution was very, very peaceful. The Syrian regime from day one said there are armed bands behind the revolution. There is no proof at all. The Syrian rebellion was youthful, peaceful, dominated by young, just demonstrating, and as a result, the regime decided to be very brutal. And I know that the Iranians are aware how brutal the Syrian regime is. Iran is not like the Syrian regime. It's, it's, a, it's a much more, uh, uh, it's, it's a post-revolutionary country. It has different institutions. It has balances of power. It has right and left and center. True, it has authoritarian practices in its regime, but it is a, it is a state that has a structure. And that structure, produced at a certain time, President Khatimi produced at a certain time uh, uh, other reformers, Rafsanjani produced uh, all kinds of trends. The Syrian regime is, is a, is a one-sided, one-dimensional, uh, extremely brutal uh, security apparatus. And to let the Syrians be massacred, uh, the civilians, in the first six months, Slowly, you ended up with the Syrian army. Uh, uh, slowly, defectors came out of the Syrian army, and that's how the uh, Syrian uh, Free Army came to exist. So I would have expected Iran to talk to the Syrian Free Army and not let others talk to the Syrian Free Army. Iran could have had dialogue with Syrian rebels that were at the center. And there were those who were at the center. It wasn't, Nusra was not there from the beginning. So was the case. ISIS was not there from the beginning. Iran could have played its cards better in Syria and better. Unfortunately, it played to the hands of those who wanted to isolate Iran in the region as, as a project, as an idea, as an independent country, as an anti-Zionist entity. Uh, as an anti-imperialist country. Those who, who wanted to isolate the Iran uh, approach it, were able to create a, 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 a fracture, a, a, tool, a, a total split between 
Sunnis and Shi'i. So everybody contributed to this Sunni Shi'i war of attrition. <coughs> war of attrition, which in a way contributed to the counter-revolution in the region after 211, where the young people in the region wanted freedom, equality, justice, better life, better jobs, uh, respect. They didn't want to be tortured, thrown in jail for no other reason. The Syrian regime went in this direction. Other regimes in the region were all in this direction. It, it was expected that Iran would have uh, been able to pick up that moment. It didn't. Now, I am not of the opinion that our ally should be in the Arab world. The Israelis against the Iranians. No. Iran is part of this dynamic of the region. It is a country that is a neighbor to all of the Arab world. It is not a settler colonial country. It is not a colonial country. It is not an imperialist country. It is a country we have differences with. But yet, we need to have dialogue with. And I do strongly believe that dialogue is important and clarifying the fact. And I also realize that whatever has happened in history can always be corrected. But that correction has to be understood at every level. So again, I think that the Arab world is passing through a stage where people would like, would feel, would want to live a true expression with democratization, uh, uh, justice, equality. The, the, the slogans of 211 will keep coming back. And I keep looking for an Iranian voice there in Iran, as much as in the neighboring states in the region uh, of, of the Arab world, as well as in the world, voices that can understand that process and ally with it, rather than marginalize it, and repress it. Thank you so much, Professor Abra. Uh, since um, we have almost uh, 30 minutes left, and I think all the panelists somehow interacted with each other in their respective remarks, uh, I would like to invite the audience to participate in the discussion. And since we are all male panel, I would especially encourage also uh, the ladies and uh, the female female participants. Um, uh, and of course, we didn't, for example, talk about the JCPOA and the future of it and uh, the uh, potential reactions from Iran, but I'm sure it will be among uh, the questions. So please, uh, I see, uh, there you go. yes. Uh, There's a female there. No? Oh, okay, where's the mic actually? Oh, okay, all right. Um, so there's a lady here, so we're gonna start over there, and then the gentleman uh, over there in the middle. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, so first on, and then exactly. Uh, please go. Can move to the coffee for salt, Tahir, but be man, no mafi. امرأة رفعت يدها راح أباشر بالسؤال مباشرة فسؤالي للأستاذ سعيد قال بأن موقف إيران في سوريا هو موقف دفاعي لكنه إلى لكن لم يوضح كيف يكون هذا الموقف دفاعي خصوصا وأن مثل ما وضح دكتور شفيق الغبرة كانت ثورة في البداية سلمية وكانوا حتى السوريين حينما نرسد when the Syrians first started demonstrating, were calling for reforms. The Iran came to the help of the Syrian regime to enable it to continue to oppress its own people. Even if we place this in the context of the region, how can Iran, after all these crimes committed by the Syrian regime, this regime can remain a strategic ally of Iran, whether in the short term or the long term. Thank you very much. 
شكرا جزيلا ايضا سؤال بالعربي Testing translation, testing, testing translation, testing translation, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, testing translation, one, two, three, one, two, three, testing translation, one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself. I am the ambassador of free Syria in the state of Qatar. Syria, which dreams of uh, peace, security, away from Russian occupation and Iranian occupation and the occupation by the criminal Syrian regime of our country. I'm not being diplomatic at all because there is a lot of uh, things which were said which provoked me, especially when the uh, Republic of Iran is supposedly a respected country. It's present in our region. We respect it. We respect uh, its interests. But we think the Iranian dream since the battle of the car is still in the hearts and minds of Iranian politicians. And after the battle of al Qadisiya and, and what happened in Iran, in Iraq, in the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. Iran has a Persian project. Iran has a chauvinistic, nationalist, Persian project, and it has never denied its uh, animosity and hatred of the Arabs for many reasons, many years. Because of its, uh, because of the nature of its, Rajat uh, its, uh, إذا لديك سؤال إذا ال... وصلت فكرتك لا بس سؤال خلي هل... طيب ما بدنا نكمل هو الترجمة فيها يمكن مشكلة مش عم بسمعك منيح بليز بي بريف ان يور كويستن ملاحظاتك وصلت My question then why does Iran now is uh, uh, resorting to deliberate demographic changes in Damascus and the gentleman said Iran has protected Damascus we have proof that the capital of the Amorites, there are serious attempts, real attempts, sometimes by using threats, sometimes by using money and other incentives to change the status of this capital, which is more than 10,000 years old. What I need here is a clear and transparent answer. Last uh, question, the gentleman here at the front. Uh, when I speak about Iran and Arabs, I have to exclude totally Shi'i and Sunni. The Iranian, there is no Ali ibn Abu Talib. The Sunnah, there is no Umar ibn Khattab. Please don't try to speak about this, this, this uh, <coughs> terms. What I say, all interests. What concerning me, Israel, American Iranian relations? When Qasim Soleimani was fighting ISIS in Iraq with Al Hashd al Shabi under alliance cover, which is America 
and are financing $500 million. When he killed the Barazani dream <coughs> in, in, in making a state uh, for courts there in, in uh, Qasem Soleimani killed the dream in two days was supported by Americans Hezbollah when went to uh, 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 fight in Syria was with the cover of Israel and alone uh, I mean permission of Israel what I say please now that American is encouraging for what is called the Shi'i crescent against a Sunni. They going to destroy each other and as in Iraq now after was destroyed they need 100 million dollar for okay, thank you. restoring. So thank this you. is America. We have to be wise as Dr. Al-Ghabra said. Why no uh, dialogue must be between these people and these people. Please save us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going <laughs> to first, so we're gonna first uh, ask Dr. Sajjad Poor, I think most of the questions were directed to you okay. before we go on to a second uh, round. Um, so there were basically the first two questions specifically um, on the rationale and on the kind of relationships with the Assad regime in Syria. Yeah. You know, the Syrian case is a very complex case. There are so many emotions involved. I understand the emotions. Uh, as a person, as an individual, as a Muslim, as a Shia, as an Iranian, I have sympathy with the victims everywhere. Victims of aggression, suppression, and so on and so forth. So our heart goes with the, those who are victims. But the question is, who is the victim, who is the aggressor, uh, when they, there are so many actors involved and so many strategic plans on, on, on the scene. Uh, Iranian revolution is against aggression, is against suppression, and is against any violation of human rights, uh, what, wherever it is. And I think this is the, let's say, the very true human dimension of all conflicts, including what is uh, in our region today. But I think there is another level, that's a strategy calculation, which misuses emotions, even weaponizes human rights, weaponizes humanitarian dimensions, and misuses everything for the strategy calculation and changing the political map of the region. So what happened in Syria was not just about human right or humanitarian dimension. It was also about changing the geopolitics of region. It was a macro uh, social engineering in the region. This is where the interest of everybody was involved. And I think you have to keep in mind when you analyze, you have to have this uh, broader uh, strategic perspective. Third layer also is needed to be taken into account, and that is the political level. I think there should be a huge work done to solve this issue politically, because there is no military solution for this crisis. And I think here is where everybody, every actor, including Iran, uh, should play a, a role, which we are play, uh, trying to do, as we have done with uh, Ostana process, we have done with Sochi process, and the other processes to contain the, let's say, the uh, upheaval and have find a political solution which is in the hands of Syrians. And it's not up to the others uh, to really uh, impose any solution on Syrians. Regime change from outside, as I said, is a strategic miscalculation. The victim of this strategic miscalculation were uh, not just Syrians, I think the others in the region. Now on the question of uh, 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 demographic change in, in, uh, uh, in Damascus, which was very new for me uh, to hear. Actually, it's what I mentioned in the beginning on misunderstandings of Iran, uh, which is very there. I mean, it is so easy to blame Iran for every misdoing 
that's happening in this region. And Iran is used as a card for the inefficiency of every player in this region. How we can change the demography of Damascus? Damascus is dear for us, not because of uh, just a strategic calculation. I think it's a historical place, it's a cultural place, and I think all this comes to the picture. But I think it is easy to really talk about Iranian project, but how you prove it's a project? I think to talk about Iranian project by itself is a project. You see, now on the Syrian, uh, on the Sunni Shia, I, uh, I have really to have a footnote on Dr. Uh, Professor Gabros, which uh, I, I found his analysis interesting and I have high respect for him, uh, not today, from many years ago. But I think Shia Sunni uh, was used as a narrative when the era of Saddam Hussein was ended in 2003. After the collapse of Saddam Hussein, there was a new era in Iraq in which the long time domination of a minority over the majority was ended. And there was a constitution in which one, one, one man, one vote became the base. Then they said, oh, 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 this is sectarian. And then the, I mean, the originality of this issue started then, and then they tried to use the sectarian for emotionalization of the region. Iran is against sectarian. Find any statement by the Iranian key leaders which is supportive of uh, sectarian. You cannot find. Iranian revolution was about the unity of Muslims. It is in the Iranian constitution. But the sectarian narrative is used uh, by uh, many players to really emotionalize the situation and to uh, really compensate their own uh, deficiencies. My final point, which I again, very quickly, on uh, uh, Professor Gabra, I, I thank him for bringing the issue of Israel to the picture. I mean, here for the last two days, I hear, uh, and I have been seeing many people, <coughs> the issue of, oh, Iran being the danger has become so inflamed that now it seems that some Arabs, Arab, I don't say it's Arab population, it's still the Arab population, the absolute majority of Arabs hate the Zionist entity. But Zionist entity is using these narratives to justify the, let's say, uh, cooperation with some of the Arab players, which I think are acting against the interests of their people. Thank you, Dr. Sajjadpour. Uh, I, I mean, we still have this gulf of perceptions when it comes to Iran's own role and the perception of Iran's role. And I think we don't have really, unfortunately, the time to uh, you know, talk uh, about the details. But uh, let me just say that there are not only emotions, but there are also facts that one side of the Syrian equation is much more brutal, perhaps, than the other side, and that Iran might have overplayed its hands somehow. Uh, you you just, cannot, no, look, either you cannot have a comment or you have to my comment. No, 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 you can, you can come back. You is, can ISIS, come back. is ISIS you can come back less that. brutal than the others? <laughs> is ISIS less brutal? Let, and wasn't well, ISIS supported by some players in the region? Uh, oh. Very short, <coughs> very, very short. Yeah, well, I because just wanted to... have to go for the second yeah, round. Yeah, I now. just wanted to bring perhaps this foreign and domestic issues together as if we are speaking as if there is a domestic Iran policy and a foreign Iran policy. Remember, these are the same players. You know, so the Iranian, let's say elite, political elite, behaves in the same way in the country that it is behaving outside the country. These are the same people. All right, so there is no two groups. For example, in Iran, the Iranian government thinks Hushan Gamir Ahmadi is not with us because he has a tie. You know, he is not a good Muslim. He doesn't pray. He doesn't have beer. And therefore, I am not part of the group. All right? And there is another group that is part of the group. And then the third group that they don't know where they stand. The Islamic Republic's foreign policy from the day one was following. There are three countries in the world. Those who are our enemies, those who are our friends, and those who are suspected to be either friend or enemies. We don't know where they stand. 
Well, that's the kind of foreign policy that they have followed. From the day one, this Islamic Republic, this theocracy, had, a, had an idea of how to manage itself domestically and internationally. Unfortunately, that particular mindset paradigm has failed on both sides. On both sides. I mean, again, I'm not going to blame Iran for everything that has happened outside. I mean, there's no question about it. And I think uh, Dr. Gabra was very uh, fair. And Mr. Uh, Dr. Sajjadpur has, has made a few very interesting statements about it. But at the end of the day, we Iranians have to take responsibility for what has happened in the region and in the country, particularly because, as Mr. Gabra and others have said, Iran is a power. Iran is a power in the region. Iran is expected to play differently. Iran is expected to create friends as opposed to enemies. You know, a Chinese proverb says, if you wanted to make me into an enemy, you sure can. I can be an enemy of Dr. Gabra for a second, just in a second. I just make him an enemy. I could also make him a friend. I think Iran has to it's, do its best to make the, the East the West and the region friend as opposed to enemy or people or the government that are suspected. I think we ju they just have to give up on that. I think regionalism is not gone. Believe me, regionalism, regionalism is right inside Iran. It's everywhere. In fact, the more we have become global, the more we have become local. In fact, the localization and globalization has gone hand in hand. So the fact that we are global means nothing, but we really are in this particular region. Iranians are Muslim. Iranians are part of this political landscape, and they cannot escape from this reality. And therefore, they better, they better face it. They better face it with, with good faith. You know, I, I think that's what Iran, Iranians have to do, both domestically and outside. There is, again, there is tremendous pressure on this Islamic Republic to really do structural changes inside and structural changes outside in its foreign policy. Iran's foreign policy, I'm sorry to say, in the Constitution is a wrong one. Iran's foreign policy in the Constitution is interventionist. So as long as that Constitution defines Iran's foreign policy, that foreign policy will become a state interventionist because it says it is the responsibility of the theocracy okay, to support the movements of the poor people, of the Islamic groups, that are being victimized by others, defend them, support them, and go helping them. So when you have that, then you come to here and try to support the poor people. But then again, unfortunately, as I have over and over said, what is the ideology and what's pragmatism has really been very different in Iran. I mean, they have been ideological, but in practice, they really haven't followed a, a, a consistent line. Wherever it served them, they have been for the poor. Wherever they haven't served them, they have been against the, uh, the, the oppressed, so-called. I think so we much. have to move that on that point. Thank you, Thank you Professor Amir Ahmadi. Do you have uh, a few remarks? Otherwise, we could I mean, my go only, to the second my, round. My, and my only quick remark, remark is that uh, definitely Iran is not to be blamed for all the issues of the region. Definitely, uh, Iran requires a, a, a series of understandings vis-a-vis -vis the region. But Iran cannot be, uh, in its mindset, uh, that's the, the victim of the Iraq-Iran war and then projecting this into the Arab world. I understand. The Iraq-Iran war was extremely problematic from the beginning. Uh, but Iran cannot be always under the, the same influence of what has happened during those eight years. 
And therefore, it needs to change the paradigm. It needs to look at the Arab world differently, and it has to feel what the Arab population is all uh, going through. Uh, 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 it could have interfered in Egypt. Where would this take it? It could have interfered, I mean, the same logic of the, uh, of the region, uh, Syria, why not Egypt? Well, why not Egypt? Why not Libya? Why not uh, Morocco? Why not uh, uh, intervention will catch up with Iran and will have very counter, uh, counterproductive uh, impact on it. And it has gotten deep into the grassroots of the populations of the Arab uh, world. I personally believe the nuclear deal was a brilliant deal. And it should continue, and I understand there are forces in the U.S. that want to end that deal and maybe push Iran in a certain direction. We have an interest that Iran comes back to the fold, but comes back to the fold understanding the requirements of that. And to do that, Iran needs to look differently to the region, to the Arab world, to the Syrian situation, to the structures. I understand at the same time the comment that, yes, Iraq was governed by it's a, a regime that was a minority, the Saddam Hussein regime. In many of the Arab countries, there is a minority in power. In Syria also, there is a minority. Why should you be with a minority in Syria? And, and, and you see, it's, it's the same dynamic in a democracy, in, in a country that opens up on all its population, Sunni, Shi'i, Alawi, Christian, Muslim, we will have a better future. And I think Iran is situated to make that change, and what the, the reason maybe it's, I, I really appreciate that you came to have this dialogue, take it back with you to Iran, because there is a need for a shift, and we will all benefit from that uh, uh, on the regional level in terms of where we're going. Uh, this repressive situation, the worst of it is in Syria and Iraq, must not continue, cannot continue. It's a disaster to see it. Thank you so much, Professor Rabra, for all those constructive uh, comments. Um, so, okay, Eight. now we have, we have almost 10 people who want to ask questions, but we're going to go for the last round, and uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, so we're going to start with uh, here, with the lady at the front. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Noha Abu Dhab from the Brookings Doha no, Center. So, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, my question is about uh, Iran's uh, foreign policy when it comes to Yemen. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, today the Security Council or certain members of the Security Council are trying to push for a resolution to condemn Iran for its uh, uh, alleged supply of weapons to the Houthis in, in Yemen. And so how would you describe Iran's involvement in Yemen? Um, because it, it seems to be not so straightforward. Um, are the Houthis indeed Iranian-backed, as they're often described in the media? And if so, what is the agenda there? And if not, if, if, there, you know, if, if there isn't you know, a profound Iranian agenda in Yemen, why are there conflicting messages coming out of the uh, Iranian foreign ministry, for instance? Thank you. Uh, thank you what so much. The, Actually, uh, the last point? Uh, the Iranian foreign ministry was? Uh, conflicting messages on Yemen. No. Um, so, okay. Now, um, so where's the mic? Can I? Oh, over there. Okay. Um, so we're going to, over there, uh, the gentleman, uh, yes, behind, behind you, behind you. Um, over there. Uh, the lady here, uh, here in the second row. Yes. Please. Um, but, but very short, please. Like okay. maximum two or three sentences. Um, okay. Um, my question is why Iran is not treating Arab world as treats Turkey? Why always undermine Arab states and dealing with Turkey? Why Iran is not? Is when, when Iran deals with, uh, with Arab countries, they're always sort of undermining Arab states. But when it deals with Turkey, there is sort of respect and, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, counting a lot in, in Turkey and, and, and how, they, how they deal with different regional um, issues. The, with, with, to this question, everywhere Iran intervene, there is, there, is a, there is a case of a failed state. How do you explain this? How do you respond to the perception in the Arab world that where Iran intervene, there was a, a case of failed state, 
like Iraq, like Syria, <coughs> like Yemen. Thank you. Uh, the lady here uh, in the second row. Yes, please. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for the, all the speakers, the panel members. Uh, one of the issues that was brought up by uh, Dr. Sajjad Poor was the reductionist perspective that we are taking towards Iranian politics. And I would say just to call Iran and its challenges the title itself and not to talk about what other roles or the roles of other players, not only in the region, but in the Cold War, the superpowers are playing in the dynamics of these nations and in this region is an underestimation of what is happening in these countries, which definitely should be uh, emphasized. And one of my questions, again, from Dr. Sajjad Poor is that, in relation to the narrative that is getting constructed every day by social media and the powers who are controlling the social media in today's world, uh, when something happens to the right of females, for example, in Saudi Arabia, after years of not having a right to vote or to drive, it's magnified and dramatized and it's become very emphasized. But uh, I also like to see what is the role of females in Iran and Iranian politics, especially with the news stories that are coming up uh, with the movement against hijab and having the freedom and uh, actually the democratization uh, for females as well as males. Thank you so much, Professor Esmadi. Uh, the gentleman at the very back, then the lady in the middle. <laughs> Uh, at the very back. The right has question. Yes. V very short, please, because we are really running out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ranjal Laldin, I'm a visiting fellow here at the Brookings Doha Center. Uh, my question for the panel is, uh, what if we were to switch the conversation around and ask... May you speak in the mic? So, sorry, yes. My question for the panel is, what if we were to switch the conversation around and ask what the Arab world needs to do to develop a more constructive relationship with Iran. Uh, secondly, very briefly, uh, my question is, wh why do we assume that Iran has uh, overreached or overextended its power, given that from where many people are standing, it's doing quite well in Syria, in Iraq, and indeed, one could say, the rest of the region as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the lady in the middle. Hello, uh, good evening. Kind appreciation and thanks to our esteemed panel members and Brookings Center for organizing this notion. Iran has reputable history and significant input in many sectors, but as the deleterious image the Republic carries, economically speaking, Iran is full of talented young men and women uh, in terms of workforce and rich expertise. However, internationally, it's not a member of WTO yet and suffered for many years from the sanctions. Uh, now with the promising step that after the nuclear, uh, nuclear agreement was signed between the previous American administration and uh, one of the largest markets was uh, interested in having a, a trade exchange with Iran, uh, especially, you know, after Trump's waving the decline of sorry, the Sorry, what is the agreement. question? What is the question? I'm getting to the question. Yes. I'm so sorry. Um, I just do understand that Iran <coughs> would like to protect its borders with uh, Syria and Iraq and all that stuff, you know, but um, as Professor Shafiq said, uh, Iranian or Iran government doesn't treat its people like Iraq or Syria, but either doesn't treat them like Sweden or Germany. Um, I'm seeing here that the all capacity to be a great country again uh, should be to solve internal issues, especially the mechanism can be adopted to overcome the high number of unemployment and poverty. How it can create jobs to the skilled young men and women and how it can encourage the SMEs without trading off the effort to change the negative image while okay, enforcing certain yes. foreign policy thank to reach you. stronger partnership with yeah. China, Europe and strategic okay. countries. Mm. My question is for Mr. Fushang 
and uh, uh, Professor Ahmadi and also for Mr. Uh, okay. Professor Thank Shukri. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, okay, now I'm... Um, so basically we don't have any... I, I'm really sorry because we have to close in 10 minutes. So if you want to ask questions, then you will not hear any answers. So we don't have any choice, I'm so sorry, uh, to go over to the panel now. So what I'm going to ask each of you uh, is to give a some kind of an opening to the future. Uh, perhaps uh, you can, t I mean, besides answering to the questions very briefly, uh, I would suggest. Um, <coughs> can you say something precise in terms of what Iran can do to create confidence with many of its neighbors, specifically in Iraq and in Syria? And perhaps uh, Professor Ami Ahmadi can talk more about, uh, you know, perhaps a few words on Iran civil society, and uh, also how do you, you see the prospects of reform uh, within the Islamic Republic. And last but not least, uh, Professor Labra can shed some lights on what the Arab world, uh, or what powerful Arab actors can do uh, to also to effect positive uh, change or perception of Iran. So should I start with like Professor Labra? Uh, you should perhaps start with uh, what Iran can do. <laughs> uh, I think before going to that question on Yemen, we have no involvement. The only involvement we have is our sympathy goes with the victim. And that is the people of Yemen who are the victim of an aggression for the last three uh, years. And I think Iran is absolutely no major player, but Iran is used by others, including United Kingdom in the recent proposal in the United Nations, uh, which was not, of course, uh, agreed upon uh, for really uh, justification of the wrongdoings of the others. But our sympathy is with the people of Yemen. On uh, Dr. Mahjoub's very question, why Iran is not dealing with the Arab world as Turkey. First of all, there is a wrong assumption in this question. There is no unanimous Arab world. We have relationship with different Arab nations, and I Iran is not on one side, the Arab world on the other side. You have, we have one of the best of relationship with the state of Qatar today, with uh, uh, Sultan <coughs> Oman. We have good relation with North African nation of Tunisia. So you cannot use this. Actually, I'm surprised by scholars of making that general statements. I think it is wrong. And Iran has not intervened in the Arab uh, world, this, the latter part of your question, when it is a failed state. I think, uh, first of all, there is no intervention. And I think what Professor Ahmed referred to constitution is a misreading of the constitution. The constitution is not for intervention in the affairs, it is for supporting the aspiration of uh, people. What uh, Arab world can do, I think, is a very fundamental question. And that is to, <coughs> to, to forget demon, demonization of Iran, not Arab world, I think some players in the Arab world, not all of them. Now, what can we do on uh, Iraq and Syria? I think this is the question you have to ask from, because we are not the custodian of Iraqis. Uh, regardless of what they say, Iraq is, uh, is a, an independent state, a sovereign state. Actually, the question uh, by itself uh, begs the answer. Syria is also a sovereign state. We are not uh, running Syria or running Iraq. I think what we have uh, been uh, interactively there is for helping based on the uh, request of the government, but I think generally there should be more bilaterals, more many regional dialogue. Here I would end that uh, regional dialogue is key, and Iran is for regional dialogue, is on the record and is emphasizing on that because the destiny of the region should not be decided by Trump and his son-in-law, it should be decided by the people in the region. Thank you so much, Mr. Sajjadpour. Um, let's go to Professor Amir Ahmadi. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
I wonder if this meeting was in Tehran, what kind of questions people would ask and what would be the concern be? I would say 95% about Iran, 5% about the outside of the 5%, 4.5% about the US, and then with that other part, you know, a quarter percent or what about the Arab world? You are this all is, invited to Tehran. This is, this is <laughs> absolute. So I think, I think if, if, if this was, I think this really is a very important point because I think the way you guys are looking at Iran is just looking at a behavior from outside. You are seeing Iran outside. You are not seeing Iran from inside. Iran is all about inside. This is a regime that is born of a revolution. And for la the last 40 years, it has been struggling to find a place for itself in the international community and something to build in domestically that will be acceptable. Unfortunately, it hasn't yet come up with a solution for either side. As I said, domestically, Iran has tremendous problems and is trying to deal with it. I mean, there are all kinds of social, political, civil society groups that are proposing different things. A group is trying to overthrow the regime. Others who have now proposed referendum, okay, to determine the future political system in the country. Even the reformists inside the country are, are saying things are not working. The former Iran's president, Ahmadinejad, writes to the, pre, for, to the supreme leader, says, please get rid of this government and this judiciary system and the, and the parliament. Clean up. I personally, myself, wrote an article with the title, Mr. Khamenei, please clean up the system. That was the title. The, the, the thing is, Iran has a tremendous problem inside. And as long as that side is not cleaned up, you cannot expect changes in international community, in the West, in the, in the region. The biggest problem Iran faces in its foreign policy is, is still U.S.-Iran relations. And that's U.S. Iran relation mirrors also its relation with the, uh, with the Israel. So the Iran's criteria in dealing with the Arab world is who is on the U.S. side or who is working with Israel. If you are working with Israel and you are with the U.S., you automatically become the Islamic Republic's enemy. This is the way the revolution saw things from the day one. So I spent 30 years on U.S.-Iran relations, trying to normalize that particular relations. And I believe and continue to believe, unless that relation is normalized, neither Iran can domestically jump, make a leap forward, nor it can change its foreign policy regionally. It will stay. The key is U.S.-Iran relations. I would, if I was you all guys, I would do everything to try to make that relation normal because everything will follow. And that's the way we have learned from history. If you look at the history of Iran before the revolution, you will see that when Iran was a friend of the West and the US, it also was living in peace and harmony with the Arab world and with Israel and with everybody else. So as long as that problem stays, I am not very help, help, you know, hopeful that the problems in Syria and Iraq and Yemen and every place else will be resolved with Iran. They are, not, they are not the real issue. They are the symptoms of, of what happens in Iran and its relationship with big powers. And particularly, I mean, the United States of America. So that's my last point I wanted to make. Thank you so much. Professor Gavra. So you well, you know, the, the, maybe the first time I met uh, Professor Sayed Muhammad was in Pennsylvania in the USA. 20 years ago. Then he was not allowed to go 20 miles outside of New York. He had to get a special permission to come to Pennsylvania to the university. We both had a panel. And that was in 2000 or 1999, 2000. 1999. Right. So 1999, 
2018, Wow, a lot have changed. And uh, besides the gray hair here and there, <laughs> and so many other things, yet uh, the region in, in our part of the world, the Arab world, because the question was, what can the Arab world do? And the Arab world uh, is also different worlds, mm. different places, different voices. Uh, I believe there is a, a, a population voice, there is a people's voice. My recommendation, Iran needs to listen to the people's voice, to the population's voice. Iran came as a result of a people's revolution. And I expect Iran to come out with a vision that can connect with the people of the Arab world, independent of sectarianism. Sectarianism will come and go. I understand there were times this religious forces came to the helm in Iran, maybe during the Iran-Iraq war in particular. But the times are changing fast. And the sectarian paradigm is a doomed paradigm. We need to get out of it in order to find a way for all of us to live in the region. So Iran can connect with that. On the other hand, I, I realize that we in the Arab world do have a duty to, to create the dialogue, to create the understanding. Uh, but Iran is a much more powerful player. Uh, uh, my recommendation would be is that there is no end to the Syrian war. I believe the Syrian situation, not only the revolution, it ended up becoming a series of wars, civil wars. Now we have a series of wars. I see that going on for several years to come. Where would Iran want to go in it? My recommendation, Iran needs to take a step backward, several steps backward. It should do the same in Iraq. It should look for partners, not followers. And when it starts looking at people, that's one paradigm. Partners, not followers, that's the other paradigm. I think Iran will find its way in the Arab world in a much better way than the one followed in the, the last few the, years, yeah. since 2011, <laughs> 12, 13, 14, until, until now. There, there has to be a paradigm shift in the Iranian situation. Now, from, from the Arab side, yes, we need to have a clear stand against any of the bases, U.S. bases in the region being used against Iran. We need to have a clear stand against anybody calling for the Israelis to make a strike against Iran. We need to make a clear stand that the nuclear agreement is a good agreement. At least it allows Iran to, to, to manage without going nuclear. And hopefully the sanctions be lifted. And it is in our interest that happens. But at the same time, it's our interest that Iran makes a shift. Dialogue is, is a way, uh, one way of doing all of this. But the other one is, it's going to be clear on the ground. Iran will not be able to see a settlement to Syria. Neither the Russians, nor the Iranians, nor the Americans, nor the Turks. Nobody is going to see an end as long as so many issues are volcanically happening in a dynamic way on the ground. There are five, six wars going on, and it could go regional. And that also applies to Iraq. There is an attempt for the rebuilding of Iraq, but without a good understanding of equality and partnership and justice. So this region is now about justice, equality, looking for a better future, uh, a stability based on respect uh, for, for people's rights. That's at the foundation of the story of this, the narrative of the region since 2011. And I do believe there is another round and another round and another round in a region that cannot settle until it reaches some sort of an understanding on its major issues. And without that, everybody getting involved in it will only uh, get uh, stuck, stuck in a very complicated uh, regional situation. And maybe the Iranians, having gone through a revolution in the past, can better understand this. And I recommend this discussion taken back uh, uh, so our dialogue will continue. And I appreciate it. I just wanted the to say one more. They said that I heard that it says that Iran has to build partnership as opposed to followership. But the problem is with the clergy in Iran, they don't believe in partnership. They believe in followership. They are, they are the kind of people, they like followers. They don't like partners. See, that's the problem I'm telling you. There's a structural yeah. but, problem. But, but you see, one point is that once you try a followership, and it's, it's, it's a disaster, and it yeah. ends up without, without results, 
then you need to change. Because if, if I go back to history, we had an eight-year Iraq-Iran war. And what happened after eight years? We were exactly at the same borders, at the same place, but with a million killed and injured, with two countries destroyed. You see, politics in this part of the world becomes so futile. So maybe we learn from this and we move on. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I think we had uh, quite an interesting discussion tonight, although many of the questions could not be uh, answered satisfyingly. I think we opened the entire spectrum of the debate surrounding Iran's internal and external challenges. The interplay between Iran's domestic and foreign policy, the interplay in the geopolitics of the region, in the rivalry primarily between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but also the role of great powers and superpowers the United States and Russia and others. So I think what we have you know, been achieving tonight, at least, is to open the entire spectrum of the debate. And we are happy to continue, of course, the discuss discussion. Um, let me uh, lastly um, point your attention to uh, two other uh, events of the Brookings Doha Center. Uh, the next one on March 7th on uh, International Women's Day and another one the week after on North Africa. So you're more than welcome to attend also those public dis discussions. And my apologies to those who could not uh, raise their questions tonight. Let me thank our dear panelists for engaging in a very frank and candid discussion tonight. And all of you, have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>